Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Psalm 33. Psalm 33, that's going to be our main text today, Psalm 33, so find that. Hang out there with me for just a little bit, we'll get to it in just a minute. We have been this month teaching on liberty. We have looked at natural liberty, civil liberty, religious liberty. This morning we'll talk about political liberty. And I know already, we, we got a little spinal tingly thing going on, right? Politics in church? That's against the law. No, it's not. Never has been. Never will be. Well, I can't say that. Depending on how our country goes, it may get outlawed. But then again, we may not be allowed to have a church as we, as we know it today uh, in this practice. But political liberty, you know, this is an important part of us as a people. And it is not denying God, it is not a, a straying from God or the Bible to talk about political liberty. Now, we're not going to sit here and try to tell you, you know, you vote for this person, you vote for that. That's what I'm, t- I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our government as it's established. Political liberty is sometimes, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which, by the way, I found it on Christian Book for $54. It's down about $20. If you don't have one, I highly recommend that you pick one up. Political liberty is sometimes used as synonymous with civil liberty, but it more properly designates the liberty of a nation, the freedom of a nation or state from all unjust abridgment of its rights and independence by another nation. Hence, we often speak of the political liberties of Europe or the nations of Europe. That's the definition of political liberty according to Webster, which I think is a great definition because we do get them tied together sometimes. It is important that we understand that we are trying and establish our nation in political liberty. Go back for just a moment and listen to the Declaration of Independence, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impelled them to the separation. So in the intro, intro to the declaration, we've already established two things political freedom from the tyranny of another nation, and that that is based on the natural law that is given and established by God himself. The laws of nature and nature's God that entitle men and women to liberty. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those aren't the only ones, but they are among those and some of the most important. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles as organizing its powers in such form as to them shall see, seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, is dictated. It will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for the light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, invents a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patent sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. There are some very important statements just in this beginning. There's a statement twice about God. 
that he is the creator of natural law, the giver of natural rights or natural liberties. And he is the creator of mankind and the universe. And that it is the duty of the people when the government becomes tyrannical to make a change. Am I talking about that we should stand up and overthrow the government? No. What I'm saying is we have a constitution that we are no longer abiding by, and it is our responsibility as the people to stand up in the power of God and in the Word of God and demand that we return to the constitutional boundaries that were established that made our country. Without the Constitution of the United States, we are not the United States. Do you realize that? This was our bond. The Constitution was the set of laws and guidance of the government to which each state agreed and became united together. It is the foundation of our laws established upon the Bible. The Constitution references God. Our Declaration references God. The Federalist Papers reference God. The Articles of Confederation reference God. The documents all through our history reference God over and over and over. We've mentioned that, so I'm not going to take any more time on that. But to say this, God gave men wisdom. They sought His face. They sought His wisdom. They sought God's presence as they came up with a form of government that could endure. A government that was run by the people. The Declaration set the standard for our Constitution that the government governs at the consent of the governed. Benjamin Franklin was approached about term limitations and how returning, we shouldn't have term limitations because returning from that lofty position of serving in Congress to back down to the lowly position of being among the masses would be too great. And this is what he said. And I can't quote it because I didn't write it down. But to the, this is the gist that he said. The governed are the masters. The governors are the servants. It was the design of the Constitution that we would have civil servants in our houses of Congress and in the presidency and in the judiciary that they would serve a time and then return. And his philosophy, his, his, Ben Franklin's ultimate statement was, since the governed are the masters and the governors are the servants, to return to the mass is a step up, not a step down. Are we a little far from that today? Do you understand the reason Oklahoma has come so far so quickly in the last couple of decades? Is because we passed an amendment that limited the terms in our House and Senate. And that started clearing out professional career politicians and started getting us closer to men and women who actually have Oklahoma's interests in mind and go to serve because they want to serve the country or serve our state. And it is true some want to, that's their stepping stone onto national government. But by and large, we get a lot of people who have interest in our state. We have one among us. This is an important piece. There was never the intent of having lofty people spend their whole life in, in, in Congress and totally disassociated from the people. When this happens... We begin to lose political freedoms. We begin to fall under the dictates of other nations as we are right now. We are being driven to great extent by nations other than America. Weak governance allows other nations to pressure us economically, militarily, whatever. And it's time we return to the Constitution. It's time we come back and say, if you don't have the, the rights or the power, according to the Constitution, to make this law, then this law needs to go away. If you don't have the power to legislate judges, then everything that you've done that is an actual legislative act is now null and void. It's gone. 
we must come back to this. It's time to return to the Constitution of the United States. It's the only way to save our nation is twofold. Christians returning to worshiping God in earnest, living their faith everywhere they go, and then pushing that our nation stand on our founding documents. This is the law of the land. This is the establishment of our nation. And if we hope to survive in what we believe America should be, we must get back to this because the day is coming and coming soon when there's going to be a push to dissolve the Constitution and move to a new frame of government. It's already being pushed. It's already being done in multiple ways through some of the laws that have been passed, ignoring the Constitution and approved, and we just sit back and accept it. We don't know our own documents. We don't know our own Constitution. That's why we're doing the Constitution 101. If you don't want to come to this class, that's fine. Let me encourage you, go online to Hillsdale College and watch the Constitution 101 for free on the Internet. But learn your Constitution. Learn the Federalist Papers. You want to know the founding of our government? Go read the Federalist Papers. There's 85 of them. They are tough to read because they speak in a language we don't use any longer. Now, I'm not talking about these and thous. I'm talking about words that are... So get you, get you a Noel Webster Dictionary and the Federalist Papers. And if you want them, I can print them for you, all 233 pages. Because this is where we stand. And the reason we need to come back to this, not only is this the foundation for us as a nation, this foundation is laid on none other than God himself. We formed our nation in God, on God, even our, declara uh, even our Pledge of Allegiance says one nation under God. God was to be our forefront. I put some things in the bulletin. I'd ask you to read it. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think it will help you. So let's look at this and see, does this fit with Scripture? Is the preacher just preaching his personal political views? Well, they are my personal political views because I believe that we have a worldview. Each one of us has a worldview. Now, whether our worldview is built on Christianity in this Bible or our worldview is taken from the world itself, that I can't answer for you. I can only answer for me. My worldview centers in Jesus Christ and on this Bible. And the worldview that our founding fathers had is centered on this Bible. And in Psalm 33, we're going to see some things I think that we'll understand, helps us to understand about our nation, its founding, and why we need to return to the Constitution or we will no longer have political liberty. In Psalm 33, beginning in verse 1, he says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. It's beautiful for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. I don't know about you, but I struggle with six. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Nature's law in the, in the God of nature. The earth is full of his good. He created it. Sing praise to him. Because he created everything. He created justice and he created righteousness. Listen, justice applies not just to us individually. It applies to us as a nation. Look at Jeremiah 13, beginning in verse 18. Jeremiah is prophesying to, the, to Israel and to the kings of Israel and Assyria. And this is what it says. Say unto the king and to the queen, Humble yourselves, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crown of your glory. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? This is God speaking first person to those he is about to judge, to the king and to the queens. And he says, where is the flock that I gave thee, thy beautiful flock? This is to a nation. What wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? 
For thou hast taught them to be captains and chiefs over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? And if thou say in thine heart, Wherefore cometh these things upon me? For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered and thy heels made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, he's saying, then if, they, if the leopard can change his spots, then you can do good, you who are practicing evil. Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passeth away by the wind in the wilderness. This is thy lot, the portion of thy measures for me, saith the Lord, because thou hast forgotten me. Because thou hast forgotten me. And trusted in falsehood, therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face. Thy shame may appear. I have seen thine adulteries and thy neighings and the lewdness of thy whoredom and thine abominations on the hills and the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it, shall it once be? He's speaking to a nation. He's speaking to the leaders of a nation. And God tells the leaders, where's the flock that I gave you? Where are the people that I gave you? Those beautiful people. And I will tell you, I believe that there is an application in this to pastors in America. I believe that we are going to stand before God and many of us who have not stood for this book the way we should, who have not taught the things that we should, who have not stood for Christ, who have not been bold to preach the truth even when it cut the grain, cut across the grain and, and stepped on toes and, and, and all the things that happened and preach about our nation, how it's tied to God. I believe one day we will stand before God and He will say unto us, Where is thy flock, the beautiful flock that I gave thee? Now, I don't know if that can apply or not. That may, be, that may be just some Davidology. But I will tell you this. One thing does apply. Every nation and every leader of every nation will stand before God, saved or unsaved. They will stand before God and God will ask them, Where is thy flock that I gave thee? Thy beautiful flock. And every nation that's turned against God is going to have a heavy price to pay. And her leaders are going to have a heavy price to pay because God deals with leadership. That's why you see in the Bible men caught up in sin and they're warned and warned and warned. But when leaders get caught up in sin, there's not a lot of lag time there. God comes to them quickly and profoundly. And that's why the Bible says that if a pastor is in error, this isn't a personal offense thing where you go to him privately and then take two with you and then bring him for the church. If a pastor is in error, the Bible says that he is to be rebuked sharply, publicly before all, that all may fear. So if you find this pastor in error, it's not quietly in my office with one or two deacons. It's right here, Sunday morning, before everybody. If I'm in error, that's where you deal with me. Sunday morning, before the whole congregation. That's Bible. That's Bible. If we will start living according to this book, we will do things much differently. Our churches will be stronger and more effective. Our people will be stronger and more effective. One of the purposes of dealing with an errant pastor is so that everybody can see God's watching. And if God will not hide the leader, He won't hide anybody else. There's no special privilege being a pastor. I don't get an out. I don't get a pass. I'm held to a higher standard according to Scripture. Not because I'm better, not because I'm smarter, not because I'm better looking. None of those are true. But because God has placed me in the position of leadership, my responsibility to God is significant. And God takes a very short look to sin and error in leadership. So don't ever be bashful. If I'm not correct, correct me. Show me in this Word of God. Now, this is not talking about, well, I'm not quite sure I go along with you on that idea. And come in and talk to me about that. And we sit down together and we study the Bible and figure out which one of us is right according to Scripture. And we, whichever one, we, we correct our, our knowledge. I'm talking about when I'm preaching error, when I'm preaching something that is not true, you don't wait, you stand up and you call me on it. That's Bible. We as a people ought to be standing up and calling our leaders on what they're doing. They're our leaders. We're the masters. They are the servants. And it's time they hear from us to be reminded they are the servants. We are the masters. 
They are there to vote according to our dictates, not what they think is right. Do you realize that a representative has to vote based on his constituency or her constituency, not what they think is right or wrong? Now, they have the responsibility, if they think something is wrong, to go back and talk to the constituency and see if they can sway them. But in the end, they vote what we say, not what they think. And we mentioned last week or the week before, asking Brother Dennis about even important legislation, how many people contact. And if he's got three or four, that's been a huge day. We're not doing what we're supposed to. We are citizens of America, and more importantly, we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and we have a responsibility to both to stand for truth and for justice. God created justice. And this justice is not just personal. This justice is national. And we need to see that He is also the creator of earth and heavens. In verse, th- in verse 6, He says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. He j- gathereth the waters in the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in the storehouse. Let all the earth Fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Listen, if we want political liberty, just as we want personal liberty and spiritual liberty, we must recognize that The creator of all is God. We as a people must recognize God as a creator. If we want liberty, we as a people must recognize the power of His Word. Do you realize what this verse just said? He gathered the water of the ocean into one place by His Word. Proverbs 8 talks about He gave His commandment that the water should not pass, and that's where they stop. You want to know why the ocean sits where it's at? Because God said so. That's it. How many times have we told our kids, well, Dad, why? Because I said so. Why do we do that? Usually because we're, we're either frustrated or angry. We don't want to sit and explain. Or we just want, we're just tired of the question. Just go in, just go do what I tell you. God can honestly say, because I said so. Period. He created the world because He said so. That verse said that He spoke and it stood fast. You know, one of the greatest experiments that's gone on in the last 15 years was done by the Institute for Creation Research. And I, I submitted this study. It is a biology report that I, that I was required to do, find a, find a scientific study on, on creation or, or, on, or, or on origins. And so I found this, and I did a report on it. I turned it in, and my instructor said, um, I think you need to redo this. I said, why? She said, well, I was looking for something that was scientific, not religious. I said, um, What is not scientific in this report? They had a question. They searched literature. They're doing experiments with controls. What is not scientific? Well, this is from a Christian Christian scientist group. I said, and did you read the initials at the end of their names? These are all doctors of hydrology and physics and all these things. These These are not some, you know, wannabe missionary school that said, here, let me just give you some titles. These guys graduated from MIT and, and all, these big co- all these big science colleges. These are all scientists who are practicing in the field. And they're doing a five-year study to determine or help determine the time frame on the creation of the world. And so they chose to look at crystals from our mantle. They chip the crystals off. They put them in a vacuum and crack them open. They measure the helium and how strong the helium is. Because helium, and I don't remember exactly now, I think helium half-life is about 10,000 years. And so if we're over 10,000 years, the helium should be totally inert, and we found that it's about 50% and found that these are crystals coming off of our mantle. You know down where you got a solid core before you get to the molten stuff? They're doing investigation, scientific research on halos in the rock, three-ring, five-ring halos. It's a study of polonium-210, 218, 214. One of those three, and I don't remember which one, has a half-life It's like .000003 minutes. And for that halo to form, those halos to form, there has to be molten uranium. But for the halo to form, there has to be solid rock. So the rock, the the uranium has to be molten, create create what's called the orphan, and then harden to leave the halos. 
For that to happen, do you know how fast that is? About one two hundredth of a second. The earth was form, cooled, and hardened in one two hundredth of a second according to science. Science. Real, honest to goodness, science. Where you have experiments with controls and repetitively. And they come to the same thing every time. The Lord spoke and it stood fast. He commanded and it was there. There was no billions of years. God simply spoke us into existence. Let there be the heavens and the earth. And it was. Science confirms this book. If we want political freedom, we must come back to understand that this God has power in His Word. He doesn't have to stir up something. He doesn't have to gin up some energy. He doesn't have to tap into some cosmic thing. He simply speaks, and whatever He speaks must happen. If we want to enjoy the political freedom we've had in the past, we must recognize the power of His Word, and we must recognize the wisdom and knowledge of the Most High. He said He puts to shame. He puts to naught all the wisdom of the unrighteous, all those that think they're so smart, all those that have all the education, all the degrees, that think they got everything down, and God said it's nothing but foolishness compared to Him. But there's a cost to this liberty. There's always a cost to liberty. There's always been a cost to liberty. And that cost is life. Whether we're talking about the spiritual liberty or we're talking about our political liberty, it comes from a sacrifice of human beings. Look with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Folks, we have no salvation, no spiritual freedom, except Christ dies on the cross, the innocent dying for the guilty. We see this first demonstrated in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. And suddenly they recognize that they're naked because the glory, the, the, the holiness that shrouded them was gone. And the first thing that happened was God had to slaughter innocent animals to clothe wicked people. And we see in the beginnings of Genesis, we see the, the, the practice of the innocent dying for the guilty. We see the cost of liberty is death. And that image is carried throughout Scripture. Dr. W.A. Criswell wrote a wonderful little booklet called The Scarlet Thread of Redemption, in which he started in Genesis and traced the line of redemption all the way to Revelation. It is one of the most precious studies you will ever read. Because, folks, there is no spiritual liberty unless Jesus dies. If Jesus didn't die, as Paul said, then we are of all men most miserable. Because if he didn't die, he didn't resurrect. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then we have no hope. Almost all things by the law purged with blood. It cost lives to bring us freedom. It cost the life of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, to pay the price for our sin. It costs human lives to maintain the freedom, the liberty that we enjoy in our country. The Revolutionary War, about 25,000 died. 20,000 died in the War of 1812. 13,283 died in the Mexican War. 620,000 died in the Civil War. 
2,446, these are American lives, died in the Spanish-American War. 116,516 in World War I. 405,399 in World War II. 36,516 in the Korean War. 58,209 in Vietnam. 7,057 in the War on Terror from 2001 to the present. And 258 in the Gulf War for a total of 1,304,684 to preserve the freedom that we enjoy. The cost of freedom is the blood of people. And the generation that forgets this is the generation that loses this. This has always been the cost. When people stand and defame our flag, oh, it stands for whiteness, it stands for, for, for racial whatever. A flag is a symbol of our nation and those who have fought and died for this nation. It's a symbol of freedom. It's a symbol of the blood that was shed to provide and maintain the freedom. It's not a symbol of one group, one person, one color, one ethnicity. It's a symbol of all the Americans who have served under that flag and given their life to make sure we stay free. Almost all those people died somewhere other than America. Because our belief has always been it's better to fight the enemy over there than to fight the enemy over here. You know where we learned that? In the Revolutionary War, when the enemy was already on our shores and going through all of our colonies. We decided then it's better and easier to protect our shores if we can do it somewhere over there. If we can defeat them there, then we don't lose our citizens here. And I realize today that's not fun to talk about. We want to ignore that. We want to try to make everything all sweet and docile. But folks, the truth is, if we want freedom, it costs lives. There's a sacrifice that has to be made. And we always talk about the loss of life, but we also don't consider how many were injured, how many were permanently disabled. I don't have numbers on that. And we often don't consider the cost of those who serve. Those who spend months and years away from their family so that you and I can come home every night and fix dinner and enjoy each other, watch TV, and enjoy being free. As we meet today, my son is on his way back out to the Atlantic. How many of you saw on the news the detonations to test the ship? That's the first one. There's three. The second one is more powerful and closer to the ship. The third one is even more powerful and even closer. That first detonation was done 100 miles off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. 20 tons were detonated at 200 feet deep, 330 yards roughly from the side of the ship. And that force was so great that it rocked the ship, shook, vibrated the ship, did damage to the ship and registered a 3.9 tremor in Daytona Beach. And the next ones are bigger. Why? The only way to know if the vessel can, can handle combat is to structurally test it. And that takes humans to do. That's just one example. And I bring it because it's the one I know the best. I served for seven and a half years in the United States Navy. Our first daughter was born in Rota, Spain. We got to come home when she was six weeks old. We'd been there less than a year, and only because Red Cross gave us notification that my wife's grandmother was dying of cancer and sent a Red Cross request to see her first great-granddaughter and only the second girl born on that side of the family. And we got to go home. And it was over a year before the next time we got to go home. And in the three years we were there, the next time we came home was when I changed duty stations. So from 1986 to 1990, 
to the end of 1989. We came home December of 89. We were home twice in three years. Loved it. Would do it again. Would still be serving. If my knees were good, you wouldn't have me for pastor. I'd still be active duty Navy. I loved it. I'm not speaking against anything. I, I don't regret what I'm doing. I'm just telling you I love the service so much I would still be in it if I could. But there's a cost. My grandkids are in Virginia. We don't get to see them. We FaceTime. Us and Sandy, we talk about our kids and share pictures and stories because we don't get to see them. There's a cost. There's a risk. You know one of the most dangerous places to serve in the military is on an aircraft carrier? In, I think it was 18 minutes on one cruise, the carrier put up 12 airplanes loaded for combat. In 18 minutes. It's a dangerous place. There's a price. There's a cost to our freedom, to our political freedom, to our religious freedom. But let's be careful that we don't get the idea that that's our total security because it is not. The military is important and we need to support it. We need to fund it. We need to tell Congress, stop talking about cutting the budget and fund our military completely and fully and give them everything they need to do their job and quit playing around and quit playing this technology game. We can do it all with satellites. No, you cannot. But we must never get caught in the idea that this is really the source of our security. This is a piece that God uses for our security, but our security comes from God. Always has, always will, and if we turn from God, He will lift His hand of, of coverage and we will be defeated. Listen to Psalm 33, verse 16. There is no king saved by the multitudes of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted His holy name. Job chapter 34 verse 24. He shall break in pieces mighty men without number and set others in their stead. Therefore He knoweth their works and He overturneth them in the night so that they are destroyed. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others because they turned back from Him and would not consider any of His ways so that they cause the cry of the poor to come unto Him and He heareth the cry of the afflicted. There is no king. There is no ruler. There is no nation that is delivered by their force by their might, by their military. It is done by the hand of God. We in America have forgotten that while it is our duty to form a military for protection, we must start at the very top of this order of protection. God is number one. We should be seeking the protection of God and under that, following His dictates for how we are to conduct ourselves, under His authority, trusting ultimately in Him. Israel goes into the promised land, and they obey God, they pray, they sacrifice, they go in and they do exactly what God told them. They march around Jericho, and on the seventh day, the walls fall, and they take the land. But in their arrogance, one took some treasure from Jericho, which God said, this first city is totally mine. You take nothing from it. You take no treasure. You don't take a rock from it. You leave it alone. It's mine. And then they go face this little bitty thing called AI. And the army fell by the thousands. And only then did Joshua wake up and go, wait a minute. We didn't come to God first. And so Joshua goes back and he gets on his knees and he prays to God. And God says, there's sin in the camp. Go find it. Do you realize 
Does anybody remember the number went at 3,000 that died at AI? Anybody remember the number? I think it was 3,000. I could be wrong. If I am, please forgive me. I don't remember, but there was a whole bunch of them. Do you realize that they were defeated because of one person? One person in some three and a half million, one and his family kept stuff that God told them not to. The sin of one affects everyone. This is why Paul talking to the church said, purge the leaven from you because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin in the fellowship affects the whole fellowship. Folks, our country, the sin of us affects our nation. Our sin doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone around us. How many times have you heard something, well, yeah, I struggle with this, but it's only me. It only affects me. No, it doesn't. It affects your spouse, your children, your neighbors. It affects everybody. And if God allowed an enemy to conquer his army because one man out of three and a half or four million had sinned against God, then what does that mean for us? Are we protected because we're Americans? We're only protected when we, the children of God, stand and the holiness of God, and honor God. And when we don't, as a people, God lifts His hand of protection, and we will no longer be America. Look through history. Do you realize Germany used to be one of the greatest Christian nations on this earth, sent out more missionaries than anybody around them? And then they turned their attention from God to other things. Now, Germany's not the big player that they used to be. England used to be a great Christian nation, sent missionaries all over the world until they began to turn their attention from God. And now England is just another nation over there who's not known for being a godly nation. And if we think for a split second that God will not remove us and make us in the same place that Germany and England and everybody else who has abandoned God, if we think for a split second God will not allow that to happen to America, we are not reading our Bible. Because God made it very clear His protection comes when His people honor Him. And when His people turn to sin, He lifts His hands and He lets people come in and destroy those nations. Our safety is in God. And the last verse is our continuance in liberty. Let Thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us. How? According to as we hope in thee. How does our political liberty endure when our hope is in him? When we confess our sins, when we trust Christ as our Savior, when we as Christians confess our sins and turn to God and tell others and stand for God and then stand for our nation. It's our only hope. Brother Alvin, this morning, would no doubt at the end of this service tell us about Chronicles 7.14, one of his favorite verses. Because God speaks first person, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and confess their sin, seek my face, confess their sins, then will I hear from heaven and forgive them their sins and restore them. Restoration of America is not in our elected officials. It's in the children of God getting right with God, putting away this world, learning again how to stand for God, how to live for God, putting away the sensuality of the flesh, putting away the lust of the eyes, putting away the pride of life, and turning again in humility to Jesus Christ. It's the only way. It's the only way we will survive. And I will be honest with you this morning. I believe that America is where Israel was in the prophecies of Jeremiah. He had told Israel to repent, 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 or judgment is coming, and they didn't repent. And finally God says, enough's enough. Here's your judgment. Jerusalem, you're going into captivity to Babylon. And if you repent now, you will go into into captivity for 70 years. I will preserve Israel and bring you back and reestablish you. But if you don't repent, Israel, 
then I will destroy you. I will destroy you with the sword. I will destroy you with famine. I will destroy you with pestilence. If you get out of the city and run to the mountains, I will chase you with the sword to the mountains and kill you on the mountains. So repent. You're still going into captivity. You're still going to pay the price. But repent. And it'll be a lot easier on you. I think America is right there. I think God is saying to us, repent. You're going to pay a price, but it won't be nearly as bad if you'll just repent. Something's happening in our nation, folks. I don't know exactly what all is going on. I can't give you a time frame. But something is about to happen in our nation. And it's going to be catastrophic. The events are going to be profound. I hope we're ready. I mean to the simple things of having some food and water, access to things. Because I think we're about to experience some stuff we've never experienced before in our nation. I think some things are about to happen. It would be a good time for us as the children of God to get right with God and start planning on an extended time of judgment. Because I believe it's coming. And I think the vast majority of Christians will listen to what I'm saying today and go, yeah, 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 I've been hearing it. Blah, 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 blah. I'm not a prophet. I can't tell you when. All I know is this. This is what the Bible says about the sin of a nation and God's judgment. And America has mirrored Israel in virtually every way you can think. We've been given the commission to take the, the word of God to the world. That was Israel's call. Display God to everyone. That's what we're told to do. That's our mission. And Israel decided idolatry, loving anything but God, was better. And God said, okay, i got a cure for that. The north went to captivity to Assyria, the south went captivity to Babylon. And he said, in the end, at the end of times, I will bring you back and reestablish you as a people. And then, we're going to deal with this last week of your history that I promised you back in Daniel, that was coming, a week of judgment like the world has never seen. So Jesus, when he was asked, how will we know? He said, when you see the fig tree blossom, a picture of Israel, you know that this is coming. It's getting close. Folks, if you're not paying attention to Israel, you need to. Not only has the fig tree blossomed, but the desert's turning into a garden. They're bringing life to the sand. It's here. I think there's another major event to come before the rapture. A war so profound, something so devastating, we're going to think we missed the rapture or that we were wrong about a pre-tribulational view. And soon... I'm going to have somebody who's been studying this for 12 years specifically start teaching a class on this very subject because I think he's correct and I can't find any place he's wrong in Scripture. I think this will happen before the rapture. And we are not ready. We are going to see things we never thought could happen. We have been so fat and sassy for so long as Americans and we have tried to frame all the prophecy based on America. Well, we're, we're God's nation now. We're God's nation now. So when America, you know, the, the rapture, the rapture will happen and that will take all the power out of America and that's when everything's going to get bad. Except that America is not really in the end times, folks. England is. Turkey, Russia, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. They're all there. America isn't. Not as a major player. So something's about to happen that removes us as the powerhouse that we have been for so many years. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Something's about to happen. Are we ready? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Because listen, if something happens and it costs our lives, if you haven't trusted Jesus, there's no heaven for you. The Bible says you trust Jesus in this life or you spend eternity in torment. 
Are we ready? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Christian, are you ready for what's coming? Are we truly ready for what's about to take place? We're going to see judgment. We're not familiar with it. We've never experienced it, but we're about to see judgment. How can God do that to a Christian nation? We haven't been a Christian nation for a long time. It's time to wake up. It's time for Christians to stand up. It's time for us to dedicate our lives back to God in earnest. Not just talk. Talk is cheap. Anybody can talk. But it takes real men and women to stand up for God. And not for an action. But I would ask this question of us. Would the real men and the real women of Unity Missionary Baptist Church please stand? Because that's the question that God is asking today. Will the real Christians please stand and repent and come back to me and do what you're called to do? Ezekiel was told, you go warn them when I tell you that the sword is coming. If you do and they refuse, you're fine. But if you don't warn them when I tell you the sword is coming and people die, their blood is on your hand. Are we going to have clean hands when this starts and people start dying? Are our hands clean? Have we warned people about the coming judgment of Jesus Christ? Because it's around the corner, folks. I don't know if it's this week, this year, next year. I don't know when. It's coming. You can feel it. Can you not feel the pressure in our nation right now, in our world? Can you not feel the anxiety, feel the tension of what's coming? It's here. It's about to happen. Are we ready? Father, you told us, even about the return of Christ, we can't know the day or the hour, but we can know when it is closed, when it's at the door. And according to your word and all that's going on, we are at the door. And there's some other things that are going to happen, we realize, but... Father, this is, it is all pressing now like a woman in travail. The, the birth pains are so close. Well, God, help us to stand up and be counted for your name and to stand up for our nation that was formed in your name. God, forgive us for turning from you into idols and to everything else except you. Father, help us to repent this day. Whatever our need is, Father, you touch our hearts and show us what we must do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand